Okay, hello and welcome. My name is Jim Payne, and I'm going to be talking about the newest genomic editing technique called CRISPR-Cas9. Um, before we get into the actual presentation, I wanted to talk about how it's in the last couple of weeks, um, CRISPR-Cas9 has become quite controversial. It's a brand new technique. It only has been really around for about two years, but um, due to some uh, things that scientists are doing, it's become quite controversial. So we're going to watch this video real fast to kind of put it in context. Design our, I mean, your kid. What would it look like? Well, it should definitely have my eyes, your, the mother's hair, and my sense of humor. Oh, God, no. Yes. No. Yes. No, be Admit that I am hilarious. Never. Hi there, guys. I'm Julian. I'm Julia, here for DNews. The idea of designing people used to be the realm of science fiction, and now we're closer than ever with the invention of new techniques. But some scientists are worried. Some are even calling for a worldwide moratorium on the practice until its effects are better known. Yeah, in a comment published in the journal Nature, scientists from the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine called some of the research, quote, dangerous and ethically unacceptable. So, how do you edit DNA? Well, genome editing is the targeted genome cleavage by engineered sequence-specific zinc-figured nucleases followed by gene modification during subsequent repair. Oh, okay, so uh, basically, a DNA cutting enzyme called a nuclease can be put into a cell that breaks the DNA at a specific place and takes out the faulty or unwanted gene. The DNA can use a synthetic sequence that replaces the faulty one as the strands are put back together. Ooh, not a bad summary. There are a couple of techniques that do this, but the most recent is called CRISPR, which makes it easier to target specific genes. Genes are long. I mean, single genes might be up to a thousand base pairs long. Previous types of editing could only target a few base pairs at a time. CRISPR uses RNA to guide the nucleases and can target a lot more base pairs. This technique can have huge benefits for humanity. Yeah, right. This kind of editing is already being studied as a treatment for HIV. Cutting out the bit of DNA in a cell that lets the deadly virus in and replacing it with something else could cure people of the disease. And other studies show it could potentially eliminate mitochondrial diseases. Yeah, so it all sounds great. So why are scientists getting so freaked out about it? Well, there's a fear of designer babies. For example, Julian could change the length of a kid's finger or make sure they have the same beautiful blue eyes. Yep, and a tail. No. But the process isn't an exact science yet. The editing could wind up affecting other genes in other places in the DNA that it wasn't meant for. The comment in Nature raised the possibility that, quote, the precise effects of genetic modification to an embryo may be impossible to know until after birth. Yeah, so this big problem is when you aren't just editing the genome of one person. In a process called germline modification, researchers could edit the DNA in embryos or sperm and egg cells, and those changes could be passed on for generations. We have no idea what those changes could do in, say, 10, 20, 100 generations from now. These fears have led to most countries banning germline editing, but it seems research is heading that way anyways. In February 2014, researchers from China created live monkeys using the CRISPR technique. Yeah, and there are some concerns that genomic editing is almost too simple. It would be pretty easy to edit embryos in sketchy fertility clinics in countries that don't have such strict laws. But man, the therapeutic benefits. Though. Man, the ethics, though. Seems like more debate and more research is needed. Let's just stick to the old-fashioned way of making babies for now. But the tail. Baby no. J could hold three things at once. Think of the multitasking. Nope, they don't. Well, what do you think? Would you design your kid? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, hit those like... So now we're actually going to get into our presentation, talking about CRISPR. Hopefully that lets you to understand not only a little bit about the concept of genomic editing, but also the potential implications of it. So a few terms before we get into it. CRISPR is simply the clustered regulation interspace short palindromic repeats. That will make sense in a few minutes. The Cas protein is just a CRISPR associated protein. If we've got a D in front of the CAS, it actually means that both domains of the protein are inactivated, which has some very cool implications as we'll get into it a little bit. Uh, the CRISPR uh, system is based on two different RNAs that make up our gRNA, the CRISPR targeting RNA, and the tracer, which is your transactivating CRISPR RNA. If you combine those two together, you get your gRNA. Um, if you have just a single gRNA, that's your single guide uh, gRNA, and then we have a thing called a protospacer, 
uh, adjacent motif that is absolutely necessary for CRISPR to work. So a little bit of background on CRISPR. First, that this whole system was discovered in the 1980s um, in terms of the, uh, the sequences here, which the bacteria, as discovered in the 90s and 2000s, it actually uses these specific sequences of foreign viral or plasmal DNA to protect itself. So by having these little short sequences of the actual DNA of the virus or plethysmid, it can create um, a specific cRNA that will bind to the foreign DNA and potentially um, protect it. So this acts very similar to the B cells um, in the human um, immune system that create antibodies, a very similar sort of system where you are remembering your um, foreign invaders that you've had in the past. These sequences are about 20 base pairs in length and the bacteria to ensure that this can be all transcribed at once and uh, create that immunity is in an array. So it's just one after the other um, inside of the bacterial genome. Now, as you can see, you've got these little red uh, uh, hexagons here all the way along. These are your PAM sites. They're usually about three to five base pairs, and they're a very specific sequence depending on the species. Um, the typical one that is used in most of the CRISPR technology is a NGG, so N being whatever base, and then GG as the PAM spacer here. And according to Bortizzi in 2014, they found that in terms of plant cells, they have 5 to 12 of these NGG PAM sites every 100 base pairs. So they're actually pretty common, which would allow for a lot of potential um, target sites for genomic editing. Okay, so just a little more background on the genomic editing process. Remember, we've talked about in class, the zinc finger and talons, these are protein-based systems. These protein-based systems are where you take a fusion of the DNA binding proteins to a nonspecific nuclease that will cut the DNA once the um, DNA binding proteins are uh, hooked onto the DNA. The CRISPR system actually is a more simple system, a much easier to set up in that it's a watson crick base pairing. You're using RNA to guide where your protein's going to go. You don't need to make all kinds of very specific proteins to set it up. So making RNA is very simple to do, very easy to do, and actually will end up making it cheaper, which I'll talk about in a bit. So in terms of the parts of the CRISPR system, if you're going to be targeting a specific gene, as you can see here, you're going to need something to guide it to there, the gRNA. And this gRNA, um, we're going to be targeting that sequence there on our um, gene of interest. You're not going to target the whole gene. You don't need to. And so the cRNA portion of the gRNA will target that specific sequence. The tracer RNA will actually be binding to the PAM site. The PAM site has to be downstream for it to be in the right position for the targeting of the, um, that section of the gene. According to uh, Molly in 2013, to give you an idea of how common these gRNAs targets could be, they found 190,000 unique uh, RNAs or gRNAs that could target about 40 and a half percent of human exons. So there's a lot of places that if we were to do human genomic editing, like we saw in the video, that we could target uh, with our current understanding of the CRISPR technology. Then you have the Cas9 nuclease, which is actually made up of two different domains, like I talked about in the vocab. You have your RUV-C and your HNH. Each one of these nucleases will cut one part, or what, excuse me, one strand of the DNA. And by cut, each of them cutting one strand, as you can see here, you end up with a double strand break. The double strand break always will occur about three nucleotides away from the PAM site. So in terms of when you're trying to figure out where your break might be, always be looking for the about three nucleotides up from the pan site. And because it leaves blunt ends, that forces the cell to either go through non-homologous end joining, if you don't have something to uh, 
act with homology, which we'll talk about in a bit, or if you do, then you can, uh, we'd be using the homologous dependent recombination. Um, or excuse me, homologous directed repair, my bad. Just before we get into the actual um, two steps with the genomic editing, or the repair mechanism, excuse me, you're going to be talking about how CRISPR, we get it into the cells. That's kind of a key part. Um, they can be found either on one cassette on a single plasmid and inserted into the cell. The advantage of that is obviously it's very simple. It's all right there. Um, or you could go with having them on separate um, cassettes or separate plasmids. So here you can see the Cas9 is actually on the plasmid and then your gRNA is located um, is outside the plasmid. This whole thing would get inserted into the cell and that would, um, the Cas9 would get transcribed and um, translated, you got the protein. This would get bound to the specific sequence and then um, you can uh, start editing the DNA. You could also do this whole system in vitro and have your protein and your gRNA ready to go and insert those two into the cell. Um, the advantage to the last two systems is you can really control the amount of dosage for each component because um, that's one of the things that we've been finding in uh, understanding of CRISPR that the right dosage could be really key. Um, and you can do that through control of your plasmids, um, not using a high multi-copy plasmid, um, or in the case of the gRNA, exactly how much gRNA you're adding. Um, these are then directly inserted in the cells. If you already have your RNA transcribed, uh, it tends to get degraded very quickly. So the process of, or the technique, with the effects, excuse me, of CRISPR-Cas9 tend to be very short-lived, and therefore you, any artificial constructs tend not to get incorporated into the genomic DNA. So if you're trying to edit the gene versus disrupt the gene, um, it, it, you need a little bit longer amount of time. Um, the other cool thing about CRISPR is that you can have multiple gRNAs targeting a one gene or multiple genes at the same time and be able to edit the genome all at once um, trying to fix a, a multiple loci simultaneously. As I said before, it's e the, the double strand break is either repaired by non-homologous end joining or homology directed repair. Let's get into our non-homologous end joining. So remember we have blunt ends created by the uh, Cas9 uh, protein creating the double strand break and in this case we don't have any homologous DNA that will match up on either side of the break so the cell has to make a decision we don't want the DNA to die and therefore the cell to die so it's going to stick them together using non-homologous end joining. Very often in the process where the cells are setting up to do the non-homologous end joining, you end up losing a few base pairs, you may gain a few, um, and this can lead to a frame shift. Now frame shifts are potentially dangerous because if it's only, if it's not a three, six, nine, a, a whole codon being missed, you can have it where every codon after that break is completely messed up and so then you, the protein will not work. You could also, in the process, create a premature stop codon um, simply by having things out of alignment. Now, when you are doing non-homologous end joining, um, you are going to end up disrupting the gene, either through the frame shift or the premature stop codon, and this is a very effective way to silence uh, a gene. Now, with uh, homologous uh, directed repair, this time you have a homologous sequence. So you have something that has homology on the left arm and the right arm at either side of your site. So when the cell sees the fact that there's something that matches up, it will use this as a template to then insert the target, uh, the change sequence that you want to put in there. So this is really good for genomic editing versus just simply silencing a bad gene. And you can and not only, like I said, change genes, you can add genes or even add whole new molecular pathways if you're doing 
the multiple gRNAs like we were talking about um, earlier. For the, the HDR to work, you need to have this, uh, cell, the, the homologous um, DNA needs to be transfected in the cell. And you really need to make sure you have a high degree of homology both upstream and downstream. So knowing the specific sequence um, is really key to making sure that you can target that um, section and not create the non-homologous end joining and therefore silencing the gene. When you're designing the repair template, you cannot have the PAM site located up here in your homologous DNA. If it's the Cas9 sees that PAM site, it's going to treat it as a potential target, and you could have it cut by Cas9, therefore eliminating the possibility of the HDR working. Um, and you can just simply change the PAM site to something else. Remember we had NGG. There's a whole bunch of other potential uh, PAM sites out there. Just changing the PAM site to what the uh, that Cas9 system doesn't recognize, then you're typically going to be fine. Another diagram, just so you can kind of see. Um, again, you've got your sgRNA. This is the CR portion of it. This up here with the stem loop is your tracer uh, portion of the gRNA. You can see here, here's the PAM site with the NGG. Once this binds, the two domains can end up cutting the DNA, creating your double strand break. If you have a homologous section, then the DNA can um, do the homologous, homologous direct repair. If there's nothing to incorporate, then you'll end up with the mutation or deletion um, and therefore lead to um, the silencing of the gene. Okay, some disadvantages in terms of CRISPR. Um, it's stead of, CRISPR is steadily becoming the standard in terms of genomic editing, um, but there are some dis uh, disadvantages. Uh, the specificity of the gRNA is really, really key, and if we're unable to produce a really specific um, gRNA due to secondary um, structure effects or things of that nature, you um, aren't going to get the proper and that's a, or the, a lot of those off um, off-site effects can occur. You also um, not having the uh, proteins, excuse me, uh, oh, excuse me, if you, the specificity of the gRNA is huge with this. And you don't have to create specific proteins for the um, sequence to work. The gRNA, like I said, is very easy and cheap to make. We're very good at being able to make lots of um, RNA specific to what we're looking for. And the technology has been kept um, open access. The, the one problem that we run into is that CRISPR does, not, does have some off-target effects, and this is where I was trying to get to. Uh, I just lost track of where I was in the presentation. The off-target effects are due to base pairing interactions between the gRNA and the genomic DNA. Um, the system isn't perfect in that you can have some of the bases not perfectly lined up and you'll still get binding. Um, so if you have up to five mismatched bases, gRNA will still recognize the sequence and therefore cut the DNA. So that's a huge potential for editing a section you didn't mean to edit. Um, and it's also very common to get this off-site cleavage um, when you have mismatches at the 5' prime end of the gRNA. To give you kind of a location, that's the section furthest away from the PAM site. And the Cas9 protein um, requires a longer uh, PAM site, will decrease the off-target effects. So in terms of dealing with these disadvantages, one of the things you can do is create a nickase. So a nickase is where you create a point mutation in either the RUV-C or the HNH, and by cutting, uh, inactivating one section, that can lead to being able to only cut one of the strands. Now, um, you still have the specificity of the gRNA, but with only one strand cut, creating a uh, single strand break, 
if you made a mistake, there was some off-target effects, as long as the um, other Cas9, um, excuse me, the other Nick Ace wasn't near there, you uh, the body will naturally use the homology director uh, pathway and take care of it. But in terms of being able to do some genomic editing, uh, one of the things you can do is if you have two uh, proximal Nick Aces. Um, you can then create the equivalent of a double strand break. Double strand break doesn't necessarily have to be straight down the middle. The fact that both strands were broken and there's no homology um, straight up without inserting it, the body will treat it as a double strand break. And when you do modifications um, doing this system, you can end up with 50 to 1500 greater specificity because you're not having to have a specific sequence for the Cas9 only, you can have it target a small amount and also a greater um, potential area cut out. Um, these sequence point mutations, like I said, will inactivate each domain of the um, the Cas9. And if you do a double inactivation, now it's going to be called the DCAS9, the dead Cas9. And um, this one has no nuclease activity, but it will still bind to the DNA using the gRNA specificity that we've been talking about. And one of the cool things is this can be used as a platform for transcription regulation. So you, the um, whole system isn't going to be doing any cutting here. It's just going to be binding, but you can add activators, proteins that are fused on, or it can act as a... Um, repressor preventing RNA polymerase 2 from actually binding and producing the protein. Um, and the, one of the other great advantages of using a DCAS9 for uh, transcription regulation is that you not not permanently uh, altering the genomic DNA. So we could have certain genes that we could turn on and increase or certain genes we repress, but we're not actually going to be going in and doing genomic editing. Uh, some other uses of the DCAS9 is chromatin and uh, immunoprecipitation. So you can actually purify genomic DNA that is bound to the gRNA. And you can, this allows for purification of any genomic sequence. You just choose what gRNA you're going to be using, and then you can purify that out. You can also do the genomic DNA imaging. So because the DCAS9 has that gRNA specificity, if you attach a fluorescent marker, let's say GFP, to the DCAS9, it can then bind to the target area that you want to see, and um, using live cells you can determine where that um, sequence is, uh, what's going on with it, and it, you do not, or it does require multiple gRNAs to bind um, near one each other to really produce a detectable signal. Very similar to when you're using a thidium bromide and the reason you do PCR versus taking the DNA out of one cell. You need to have enough of that signal to really be able to detect it. You can also do epigenetic editing. So instead of having the DCAS9 fused to a fluorescent marker, if you have it fused to a demethylase, you can remove the methylation in the epigenome and potentially target a epigenomic um, trait. You also have genomic screening, so you can have pools of these gRNAs that can then do um, can screen genomes because of the specificity again of the gRNA. And using a, a DCAS9, um, you could either use it as a fluorescent marker or um, some other method to try to be able to like the um, Uniperocipitation to screen the genome. In terms of the future of CRISPR Cas9, as you saw in the video, we could be doing human genomic editing. So this could be used to treat disease. If you got a disease where you can inactivate a bad gene, that's one thing you could do. You could cut out the gene completely and put in a new good gene. Again, a nice way to treat a disease. But inevitably, we're talking about people designing humans because there's going to be a scientist out there that is going to either do the money or just wanting to know um, 
will probably start uh, wanting to do designer babies, and that's what we ran into with that video. So there's lots of ethical issues when you're talking about human genomic editing. Um, one of the other uh, big things in terms of the future of uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is transgenic plants. So this one, you instead of having to do selective breeding and hoping and praying something's going to work, or having to go uh, in and alter the DNA through other methods, because CRISPR-Cas9 is very specific and allows you to target a gene actually much better than typical mutation systems, you can have a, uh, increase the predict, uh, predictability and success rate of genomic modification of plants. You can even insert genes um, that normally wouldn't be found in a certain plant to help with things like food quality or pathogen susceptibility. Um, you could even, if a plant produces a valuable end product, let's say we're talking about the uh, Ebola virus, how they were talking about creating a vaccine using plants, you could alter the plant to make sure it's increasing more of the things necessary for vaccine and um, we're not wasting that metabolic flux um, on other products. And remember too, you can do multiple modifications simultaneously using CRISPR-Cas9. Um, the other thing that this does, and this is one of the things that was in the Bortizzi paper, is that this method gets around a lot of the regulations. In Europe, there's a big regulation push to um, prevent GMOs. Um, but the regulations focus on the specific processes, the um, talon or the zinc finger, and not necessarily what comes out of it. So this may be a method um, where we can do the modifications and not have to worry about the, um, the uh, uh, do the modifications without having to worry about the regulations. Um, and as we keep growing in our understanding of CRISPR-Cas9, it's very likely that most, if not all, of the off-target effects will disappear. Um, I found two great videos on the CRISPR-Cas9. This one is a short animation, only a few minutes. And this one is actually a longer explanation. It's a web webinar that helps explain CRISPR-Cas9 um, in case there's something you missed or would like to know more. These are my references. Like I said, the Bortizzi and the Molly article gave us some um, additional information. There's a significant amount of information on not only the background, but how CRISPR-Cas9 is used in these two um, articles. And thank you for watching.